Stand as the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. With that said, we welcome you on this Trinity Sunday. Today we're looking at the eminence of God, the glory of God. And so there is a handout that I'd like you to look at, uh, Psalm 8. And so you can look, you, uh, there's a handout that I gave. It'll be on the screen as well as in the hymnal you can find Psalm 8. And then also, too, um, I'm pushing you as a congregation to sing some new hymns. Um, the one that we're going to sing in our opening is actually the same hymn, too, called Hail the Festival Day. That's a little more complicated. And then there's another famous hymn that I uh, would like to sing entitled, All Things Bright and Beautiful. And so both of these speak about the Trinity, but also the creative power of God the Father. And so we'll hear about that within our liturgy. And we also will open up with those words, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And we'll sing that to tune as well, too, between the readings. So all of this stems from the very fact that God has revealed himself in creation as a loving father who also redeems us as his people in Christ Jesus. And so with that said, let's greet those around us in the hand of fellowship and welcome. Hello. Hello.
mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which I have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our waywardness and sin in order that we might rise to newness of life by faith, and that we may be his own and live under him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. O oh God, our Creator and Redeemer, hear our pleas for mercy. We have turned away from you and rebelled against you by going our own way. Because of our sin, we have discovered it as not good for us to be alone. Without you, for the sake of the glory and honor of salvation, won for us your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Forgive us and restore us in the image of your own life and love. Amen. God offers all the treasure of justice, truth, and righteousness. His love beyond all measure and high as the heavens above us. So far, since he has loved us, he puts our sins away. Therefore, in the stead and by the command, my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we would invite the children to come forward. Our young people to come forward. Come on up here for me. Let me ask. You. Stand right here. Your brother? Comes? All right. Good. Good, good, good. Let me ask you a question. How tall is this building? How, how high do you think that is? Super high. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good description. I, I've got, I got two things here. This is a tape measure, right? This only goes to 16 feet, but I imagine if we can't keep on measuring it, this will probably fall over in time. But I don't think I could reach the top, could I? Do you think I could? No, if I could. So, so how? And then imagine this was a, how big do you think God is? If this is super high, how big do you think God is? Yeah, I don't know. You know, we don't know how big God is, but we know God is everywhere. Isn't that amazing? So if I had a telescope, would I be able to see God? Yeah. Actually, I wouldn't. <laughs> because God is so big that he's everywhere. And yet, at the same time, he's in our hearts. And so he's everywhere, and yet he's with us. And so that's kind of amazing, huh? So I don't think I have enough tape measure here to measure how big God is. But isn't that wonderful that even though God is so big, he knows us by name? The Bible tells us that he knows us by name. Yeah, but I think he's this big. That's a little short for me. <laughs> but you know, God, is, God knows us. And isn't that wonderful that God knows our name and loves us? Yeah. Well, let's pray, shall we? We say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. thank you for loving us and, and knowing our name. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So you can read a, you can read along with us, okay? Listen up for us today, okay? Okay, you all right, thank you. You can go back. All right. We invite you at this time to uh, read our scripture lessons. On this day, as we marvel at God's person as a triune God, the Old Testament reading exalts him as the one who in the beginning said, let there be, and brought all creation into existence. With joy we hear the creation song, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, 
and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separate the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And so it was. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of heaven, of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swam according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green, food, green plant for food. And it was so. And God, saw every, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Today's epistle lesson continues Peter's Pentecost sermon. He gets right to the point that God raised Jesus from the dead and exalted Jesus to his right hand as Lord and Christ. As we hear him, we know he's not just talking to people in Jerusalem in 30 AD. He's talking to us. We hear Acts 2, 22 to 36. 
Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Be therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath with, to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of all that we are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not descend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise to sing together our hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. The Gospel reading for today comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. This reading for today is called the Great Commission. And in no other place in Scripture is God's name, as the triune God stated so clearly, as in today's Holy Gospel. It comes to us in connection with Jesus' command to go and to make disciples, to baptize, and to instruct. We hear the last paragraph of Matthew's Gospel. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated. We sing a new hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
Good morning and welcome. Our uh, sermon text for today actually comes from our gospel lesson for today. And the gospel, excuse me, not from our gospel lesson, from our psalm today. Sorry about that. And uh, the opening line is, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's sing that song, shall we? Uh, it's in the liturgy, but it's, you may also have that on the other side of all things bright and beautiful. So we'll try singing that through once. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We praise your name. Thank you very much. We begin with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the blessings of your revelation as our Father and Lord, but also as the Trinity. We pray that in the strength of your creation, we may see your goodness and see Jesus as well as Savior, given to us as a gift of your love and grace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Some years ago, I had had the opportunity of Hiking the Grand Canyon, a friend had invited me. And as we walk down the Grand Canyon, you can't but yet marvel at the magnificence of natural creation. And that's one of the wonders, isn't it, of going to state parks and especially federal national parks and seeing the eminence of some of God's greatest creation in their expanse. Well, as we made our way down on our first night in the valley of the Grand Canyon, one of the park rangers invited us to go on a hike. They called it their midnight hike. And the one caveat was that you could not have any flashlights. It was all by natural light, and the moon was out bright. And because of the canyon walls, you had this great view of the stars with no artificial light coming in. And so we walked, and he brought us really a short distance in, response, in, in, in thinking about it. But it was really to this opening which kind of appeared like this picture that I have on the screen and all of the eminence of God's dominion and all his creation almost causes one to sing out, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. You probably recall moments like that in life when you've seen great things of creation and just marvel at what it is. The sad part was we went back to our campsite and there by, na by artificial light of the flashlight and then a little bit later on when we made it up to the top of the mountain, not the mountain, the, the valley of the canyon, we then found ourselves with a lot of artificial light. And that's probably one of the sadder parts of our modern life is that artificial light kind of drowns out the stars, the Milky Way, and all that God has created. But sometimes we get a glimpse of that. And you know, for me, that's always kind of become the thought, isn't it? It kind of becomes the thought of the fact being is, is that we lose our connection with God and his creation because we fill things that are artificial. We don't reveal, we don't see the natural beauty of God and all of his glory. And so our lives seem to be less connected with who God is. Today, of course, we're looking at the Trinity. But more than that, we're looking at God as our creator and especially as we look today at Psalm 8. We hear these words in the opening of the psalm. If you could turn the slide. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all, of the, in all the earth. You've set your glory above in the heavens. As we look at Psalm 8, we want to once again look at what Israel looked at. 
Psalm 8 has been described as a hymn of glory, and it's written specifically by King David. Now, King David, of course, was a king at the end of his life, but in his early life, he was a shepherd and probably spent many days under dark skies looking at creation and composing this hymn. And so it is that we look at this hymn. The shepherd boy who would become king gives us words to remember and to sing in our hearts. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. The translators of this ESV and also the NIV probably don't give as much credit because in the Jerusalem Bible, they keep the Lord's name as his official name. For reasons and for custom, translators will take the name of God and use Lord in order to respect kind of that historical view of God's name not being used out of context or out of worship. And so it really should be, O Lord, our Lord, or Yahweh, our Lord, the name of God meaning that he is to be, or I am who I am. David recalls the very fact that God's majesty is without limit and without time. And the mightiness of God is seen in the small things of creation. And that's kind of what the psalm brings to mind for us as well too. In the pitch black sky, David recalls for us that when I look at your heavens, the works of your finger, the moon, the stars which you have set in place, just think of those works of your fingers I mean, we talk about building a house sometimes, and people use their hands to build a house, but David has something even more intimate involved. He's probably thinking of an artist or a sculptor who requires not just their hands, but every fingertip to touch the clay in order to build and to make the statue. And so it is that David is recalling that all of God's creations have his fingerprints on them. And when we think about it, just think about it, the moon and the stars which have it been set in place. I mean, God has given them a time and a place. This kind of reflects our Old Testament reading. Again, if you look there, you probably can recall it from memory, of course. I think many of us have great memory of Genesis chapter 1, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bible commentaries and also uh, preachers remind us of the fact that Psalm 8 is also connected and reflecting Genesis 1. And that's why we've chosen for this day, not me personally, but the lectionary has chosen Genesis 1 as well as this psalm to recall for us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you may see throughout the reading that I underline the word good. Because when God created and when God made all things, he saw that it was good. It was put in place for his purpose, and his purpose, it was all put in place. The sculptor who creates leaves his fingerprints, and so it is that God left all that he created. The interesting thing about this is that in the original Hebrew, there is a verb that to there is a verb that is translated as to create or to make. And it's only attributed to God and his person. It's not used to talk about humans making things. There's a separate word. And yet we don't get that in our translation of English. But yet the writers of Hebrew, Moses and other authors, made it clear that when God created, he created out of nothing. And in speaking the word the physical universe came about. And that's really reflected in this psalm. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. We'll come back and talk about the enemies of God and how he stills them. But he reminds us, of course, that when he looks at the heavens, the works of his fingers... This causes David to cry out in the next verse, What is man that you're mindful of him, that the son of man that you care for him? I mean, if God is so great and creation is so grand, 
What is mankind in the eyes of God? David is simply astonished by the very fact that the distance of God from man is so great, and yet in the eyes of God, these specks that live on one planet among millions are the concern of the Creator. So the reflection of God as Creator, who sees the world and sees that it all is good, also reflects on you and I, as his creatures. It's one of the reasons why in our Christian faith we reflect those words that say, I believe in God the Father. You see, when we talk about our Heavenly Father, like earthly fathers who care for their children and know them very well, God our Father in Heaven as well too knows us so well. The Christian faith commands us to recognize that the creator of the universe, who is so grand and massive and so majestic, yet still knows us by name. And that's really kind of why when we look at Matthew 28, there when Jesus gives the great commission to place God's name upon his people, God is establishing the faith of his people in the hearts of his people. But the world doesn't see that. The humanist philosophers like to speak of God sometimes as a watchmaker, someone who winds up the universe and doesn't even care about its creation. But when we speak about God as a loving Father, it identifies an intimate relationship that He has with us. To the humanist philosopher, God means nothing. Sadly, even to many in the world, God means nothing. But to us, we see him as our heavenly father. And it's one of the reasons why in the Lord's Prayer we pray those words, our father who art in heaven. So why does the creator care for us? The short answer is that it's God's grace. I mean, think about it. Frail human beings who have failed to pay attention and even have not lived out God's calling receive the grace of God. It's the reason why John 3.16 makes it so clear with this psalm in mind. For God so loved the world. And that's reflected, right, in that question. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Reflecting from Genesis, we again see these things. Verses 5 and following Yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, all beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. As God as Father, he placed mankind in, above in his creation. But mankind fell, didn't he? We call it the fall in our theology, but really mankind fell in its relationship with God and broke this creation. And all that God, that, all that God created, which was good, fails. Our bodies fail, our relationships fail, nations fail, people fail because we're finite and broken. And yet the God of heaven, our Father, gives to us a position of authority to care for his creation. But with the fall, there comes the brokenness. And that's why it's interesting, actually. Psalm 8 is used by the New Testament writers to identify Jesus as the one who will, as he says, put all things under his feet. You see, Jesus Christ, is identified by the writers of the New Testament. The Apostle John writes these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not nothing that had been made. You see, in our creeds, we reflect the language of Scripture, who, being with substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. The Apostle Paul even begins to identify that Jesus Christ is this one who will sub 
do all things under his feet. Where man fails, Christ, our Lord, takes over. And that's what Paul writes in Ephesians. He says that he, God, worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rulers and authority, power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. He puts all things under his feet and gave him a head above all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. If Adam and his descendants failed, the second Adam, which is identified in Scripture, who is Jesus Christ, came to put all things made right. That proceeding from God the Father and being in substance with the Father took his position of authority, but not to rule as much as to serve. Just listen to the writer of Hebrews in the second chapter. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, God left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything subjected to Christ, but we see him who is a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory, honor, because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. You see, Jesus is called the second Adam because he died like all sin, like all mankind died, but he is the first fruits of creation. The New Testament writers take into account that in Christ's death, he overcomes and begins what we call the renewal of creation. You see, the Christian faith does not discount the physical creation of God. It still says that it's God's creation, and although it has fallen, he still has redeemed it in Christ Jesus, in his death and in his resurrection. And Jesus, being the first fruits of the resurrection, will come once again to restore all of creation. That is the Christian hope that we live in. Too long, I think, when you look at society, people are really concerned about the end of the world. They're held in fear because they sometimes think, or they think that God is not in control. I mean, think about all of the things that our society tells us, whether it's illness, uh, pestilence, great world wars, AI now is the next thing that will take us all out. And all of that begins to recede into the thinking of people, and they then begin to think that there is no one in control. But what we learn from our psalm as well as what we learn from Genesis is that God is in control. And that although things seem to be out of control, the one behind it all still is the one guiding it into its existence and also giving its purpose. And that when Christ comes again, this new heaven and this new earth will be the renewal of what was old, will be made new once again. And it will receive its perfection. Our bodies will not die. There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. And what God had made and man brought in its fall will be restored in Christ fully when he comes as Lord and Savior. And that's why David is mindful of this. When he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. May we remember that in this world we live in, God is in control. His magnificence and his glory can be seen in creation. We only need to take it in and remember his love for us in Christ. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Today, we want to rise and confess our faith. Today, we look at the first article of the Apostles' Creed found in Luther's Catechism. The first article of the Apostles' Creed and its meaning shows us 
that as Christians we confess, I'm God's creature. He is our Heavenly Father who loves and cares for us. This enables Christians to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes and ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He give, God give me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Today in our prayers, we want to pray for Linda Sharp, who will be having surgery. We also want to pray too for others that are, that are dealing with illness. We also want to pray in thanksgiving for healing as well too. We recognize that, that God heals as well as he gives us strength to overcome our trials. Let us pray. God of heaven, we come before you with blessings. You call us to be your children and declare us as your name is placed upon us in that gift of baptism, Lord. We take on new identities. Your spirit begins to reside in us and our hearts are changed. Lord, we pray as we journey in this life that our faith may grow, that we may find strength in who you are. Above all, Lord, help us in times of doubt to look at the grandeur of your creation and see that although you're great, you still care greatly for us. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the blessings of life. Above all, we pray, give us this day our daily bread, and we are reminded that daily bread is not just food, but it's everything that you give to us, the things we need, the things we want, and even the gifts that we are unexpectedly receiving from you. We pray, Lord, for healing for those in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for the healing that you have brought to members of our church and families who are struggling, and yet you bring them through it. We thank you, Lord, that you be with us in times even when we find it difficult to stand under those trials. Be also with those that are sick and are in need. We pray especially for members of our church, for Doris, Francis, Alton, Georgia, Carl, Doris, Roger, Ruth, Debbie, Glenda, Reggie, AP, Gail, Janelle, Linda, and Priscilla. We pray, Lord, that you be with Linda and Priscilla. Priscilla will be having ablation of the heart. And we pray also for L Linda, who will be having surgery, knee surgery. We ask that you give guidance to doctors and help them as they recover from these procedures. We pray, Lord, for friends, for Steve, for Brooke, for Sister Amy, for Vernon, Carson, Emery, David, Lynn, Willie, Joyce, June, Nathan, the Vasilia family in Iran, for men of our congregation, for Bobby, Pastor Bobby, for Anthony and James and their families as they are deployed and serve. We pray all of these things into your hands, O Lord. We commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, you may be seated. We will receive our offerings to the Lord. 
We ask you to please fill out our friendship roster if there's any change of address, email, or phone numbers. with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, <laughs> Almighty Father, and everlasting God. As your children, you have given us a perfect love. To see your Son, Jesus Christ, in his humble birth, perfect life, sacrificial death, and glorious resurrection, by which you give us the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. There, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And also after supper, he also took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the covenant in my blood, shed also for you for the remission of sins. This do also in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We sing together.
Almighty God, Father, your patience toward us is great. Your love is without limit. Grant to us grace that we, by the forgiveness of our sins, be kept holy and pure to the day of Christ's coming again, when we shall stand before the judgment seat on high, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our sending song, Holy, Holy, Holy. Please be seated on behalf of our congregation. We welcome those that are watching. We pray that our worship was a blessing for you. If there's any questions or any thoughts stemming from our worship today, please, I find it an honor to speak with you following our service day or at another time, especially with those that are here as well, too. Again, we want to invite you to Bible class. Today we're looking at the lessons, and we're also looking at the Athanasian and the Apostles and Nicene Creed. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those creeds are and how they're important to the readings for today. And then also, too, we want to remind you as well, too, please keep in your prayers VBS, not for this week, but next week. Um, and then also, too, uh, please also look for some scheduling that we'll be doing. Um, there's a training at the end of the month for ushers and uh, for greeters. If you want to be part of that ministry, it's a great opportunity to be part of that, to learn about that. As you know, in a growing area, we want to be able to be responsive to those that come and visit with us. So. With that said as well, too, have a wonderful uh, week. And if you need anything, uh, please be in contact with me. You can find my contact information 
in the announcement part there. But with that said, have a wonderful day.